Hello everyone and welcome to The Vengeance of Unpayable Debts, Racial Capitalism and Claiming Debts from Below. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the organizer, Rival, uh, the, Re the Reimagining Value Action Lab. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'd like to invite the use of the live transcripts and subtitles function, uh, which you can turn on in your settings. Um, and I'd like to invite the use of the Q&A. Uh, we'll be taking the questions later, but you can post them whenever you want. Um, for those experiencing any technical problems, the event is being live streamed on Rival's Facebook page as well, so you can see it there. Um, I'll be your facilitator tonight. My name's Catherine, and I'm a researcher with Economic and Social Research Aotearoa, uh, working on ideas of finance, coloniality, and decolonization. Um, I'm writing a book currently to come out later this year, which is called The Financial Colonization of Aotearoa. Just to give a quick overview of the topic we'll be speaking about tonight. Uh, this is from the event description. As the late David Graeber's bestseller, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, taught us, unpayable debts have long been a tool that the powerful use to subjugate the oppressed. No less today when, as Denise Ferreira da Silva shows, the weight of debt disproportionately falls on the shoulders of those already encumbered by the burdens of racialization. But da Silva also encourages us to recognize the kinds of unpayable debts we owe to one another, to our ancestors, and to common struggle that might be the grounds of re-emergent solidarity. Likewise, Francis Negron Mutineer's investigation of Puerto Rico's colonial unpayable debt reveals that artists, activists, and intellectuals are seizing the moment to ask profound questions of who really owes what to whom. Likewise, the activist group Debt Collective is seeking to organize otherwise isolated debtors into a union of collective refusal and reinventing solidarity along the way. Can such efforts truly challenge a form of global racial capitalism that appears, as Max Haven argues, to be taking a kind of nihilistic revenge on the planet? Before introducing our guests, um, just an overview of what's going to happen and some ground rules. So we have four questions uh, which we pose to each speaker in turn. This will then be followed by facilitators questions. And um, while the guests are welcome to use the Q&A to post questions at any time, the facilitator myself will pose them at the end. And please keep these questions uh, succinct and try to just ask one at a time to enable more people to ask. Uh, we'll wrap up the event in about 90 minutes time. So on to introductions. Denise Ferreira da Silva is currently professor and director of the Social Justice Institute at the University of British Columbia, Canada. Her academic and artistic work addresses the ethical political challenges of the global present. She is the author of Toward a Global Idea of Race and co-editor of Race, Empire and the Crisis of the Subprime, as well as Post-Colonialism and the Law and Indigenous Peoples and the Law. Her book, Unpayable Debt, will be published in 2021. Francis Negron Mutineer is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and scholar, and professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. She is the editor of several books, including Puerto Rico Jam, Rethinking Nationalism and Colonialism, None of the Above, Puerto Ricans in the Global Era, and Sovereign Acts. She is a director of the Unpayable Debts Working Group of Columbia's Center for the Study of Social Difference, which compiled three open access syllabuses on debt regarding Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and global debts. Max Haven is Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media, and Social Justice at Lakehead University, located on Anishinaabe lands in the North Shore of Gichigami under the Robinson Superior Treaty, Thunder Bay, Canada. He is co-director of the Reimagining Value Action Lab. His most recent book is Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. Haven is editor of Vagabonds, a series of short radical books from Pluto Press. The present panel emerges in part from work Haven undertook as a visiting scholar at UCL's Institute for Advanced Studies in 2020. Hannah Appel is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Global Studies at UCLA, where she teaches, researches, and writes about the daily life of capitalism and its imminent alternatives. Hannah is also the Associate Director 
of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy at UCLA, where she directs the Future of Finance research stream. She is the author, most recently, of The Licit Life of Capitalism, U.S. Oil in Equatorial Guinea, and a co-author of Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Financial Disobedience and Debt Abolition. Hannah co-wrote the latter with her co-conspirators at the Debt Collective, a militant, debtor-powered activist group that builds debtors' unions. Just like to thank our co-sponsors tonight. So we have the Reimagining Value Action Lab at Lakehead University, the Race and Capitalism Project at the University of Chicago, the Luskin Institute on Inequality and Democracy at University of California, Los Angeles, the Institute for Advanced Studies at University College London, and the Debt and Education Working Group at the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Okay, so the first question that we have for our speakers tonight, on which each of them will speak for about three minutes. I would like to begin with the question of the way unpayable debt functions to perpetuate oppression, exploitation and extraction in our moment. Can you offer an illustrative example of how you see this working and what it reveals about those broader systems that mobilize debt, in particular unpayable debt, in punitive ways. Um, so if we could maybe start with Hannah for this round and then go to Max, Denise and Francis and then we'll swap it up next round. Over to you. I have no, I have no idea what I was gonna start, but I'm happy to do that. And thanks so much to everybody. It's really an honor to be here. So just to answer this first question, I'm actually gonna share a quick image. Um, this is Standard & Poor's most recent foreign credit risk ratings in which the world, and I'm obviously channeling race empire and the subprime here, or perhaps not obviously, I should say it. I'm channeling race empire and the subprime here. But so you can see, because you can look at what the colors mean on the bottom, that the world's mightiest settler colonies, right? Canada, the United States, Australia, enjoy the highest ratings alongside Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, and Finland an interesting map of particular histories of white financial supremacy. Countries in South America, the Middle East and Africa disproportionately occupy the other end of the spectrum with 24 of Africa's 53 countries not even rated, right? Which is the light gray right there. In other words, so, so risky as to be illegible to this system of risk categorization. So I chose to start with this map to answer this question because to me, what we see here is a kind of map of the financial infrastructures of global racial capitalism, right? And this is not a map that one can easily just dismiss as like, oh, this is, you know, this is just an oversimplification and this is what finance always does. It puts colors on a map because this map has radical effects in the world. The interest rates that people in these places, governments and otherwise pay on loans, the contract terms that these governments enter into when, for example, they enter into contracts with large US oil companies, which is the subject of my first book. And of course, monetary sovereignty, right? Where are the so-called hard currencies here? Where are the so-called soft currencies here? Who borrows in whose currency? Hint, everyone borrows in the US dollar, right? And has to pay back in the US dollar. So this is also a map of kind of the, the imperial power of the US dollar. But it's also, you know, this, obviously it's big, it's a global map, but I think it's really important to think of the intimacies of this map too. And this is the kind of last thing that I'll say in my opening three minutes, which is to say, this is also a map, obviously internally differentiated within each of these kind of misleading boundaries. It's a map about households. It's a map about communities. It's a map about intergenerational wealth transfer, right? So the intergenerational wealth that's transferred to the white world from imposing a debt on Haiti in the wake of the, the Haitian revolution or imposing a debt on Kenya in the wake of Kenyan independence, right? So it's about intergenerational white transfer for the elite white financiers and their families and progenitors of the world. And it's of course a map about intergenerational wealth theft, intergenerational land theft. And so it's, it's both historical, but it's also obviously 2019, right? It's contemporary. It is literally about the conditions on the radically variegated uh, conditions under which people enter into the capitalist system. So the last thing I'll say from my organizer perspective, from my activist perspective about the intimacies that I'm involved in in organizing debtors unions here in the United States is that what you see, needless to say, the United States itself should be also divided into all of these different 
colors, right? And color is relevant here with its relevance to race, which is to say that just as Africa, you know, however many of the 53 countries are in light gray here, what we see in our work organizing debtors unions, whether it's in our work on bail and debt in the criminal punishment system, whether it's in our work on student debt, whether it's in our work on housing debt, that it is disproportionately across all categories of household debt, black women who own that debt disproportionately, always and black women who pay higher interest rates always, right? Even if they have the same credit risk, quote unquote, which is to say the same, um, generally a mix of their income and their past credit history. So I, I give this map as a kind of macro introduction, but I also want us to read intimacies from it. Uh, Max. Thanks so much. It's really wonderful to be here with uh, other panelists from whom, from whose work and from whom I've learned so much over these last few years. Um, I've recently been thinking a lot about revenge and I've been thinking about how the global capitalist order into which we live awakens a desire for revenge for all of the crimes and cruelties that it's unleashed, but also the way that that system unleashes forms of revenge. And I've been thinking about revenge as a way of coming back to some themes that have occupied me for a number of years, including the strange power of debt and the strange power of finance and financialization. Um, and having written a little bit about that recently, I've now started turning my attention in the last few weeks to questions around climate debt, which I sort of wanted to focus my comments on um, today. And the strange ways that we speak about climate debt, um, there is increasingly an appetite um, in the halls of power to speak of this thing called climate debt. But as might be expected, that debt can only ever within the thought world of the episteme of the powerful be articulated and expressed within their metrics and logics and measurements of value. So the climate debt as it is presented uh, is that yes, perhaps indeed, uh, the wealthy nations of the world that Hannah just uh, mapped for us do owe some sort of debt to the nations of the world who have been immiserated by 500 years of colonialism and capitalism. Uh, and that, that debt should be paid in terms of perhaps uh, admitting greater carbon emissions from those uh, immiserated states, or perhaps it should be uh, done in some form of cash transfer. These debates are ongoing at some of the highest levels of power. And yet what I think is goes unspoken is first that the debt that might be owed for the form of white supremacist modernity that uh, created the climate crisis, the form of capitalist modernity that created the climate crisis that is now drowning whole islands and threatening the displacement of millions if not billions of people around the world those debts on some level cannot be repaid. Um, and the destruction, the wholesale destruction of whole civilizations or the scattering in the diaspora of those populations to the four winds threatens to annihilate precisely those forms of human being and human collective becoming that might give us the solutions or possible answers to creating other forms of modernity or other pathways of human togetherness beyond the capitalist imperialist model that has driven us to this point. And second of all, to the extent that these plans and perspectives attempt to account for climate debt in the language of money, and here I'm drawing on uh, David McNally's recent, very interesting work on the violence of money and the colonial violence of money, they in fact attempt to pay an unpayable debt with the same coin in which that debt was issued, the same coin with, win, with which the, uh, the violence that created that debt was issued. And I think it brings us to a strange impasse, and I'll close here, because on some level, um, it leaves many movements in a place where since there is an opportunity and splits between elites, it is tempting to call for the repayment of those debts in the forms of capitalist money we have. And yet those represent fundamental limits on our imagination and arguably to create that much money to pay that debt would require the extension, the elaboration and the amplification of the system that caused those debts in the first place. Um, thank uh, Max um, and Catherine and others uh, involved in this event in 
uh, for the invitation to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, so on payable batch in the ways, uh, the way I use it is an image uh, designed to capture how raciality, uh, how true raciality colonial uh, power modes, conquest, settlement and enslavement. And also colonial modes of juridical economic subjugation remain operative in, in global capital. But then of course, this is um, it's a complex uh, proposition that I can't even begin to try to unpack now. But it made sense as a, as a phrase in trying to figure, as an image in trying to figure the ways in which the subprime loans uh, operated in the global economic crisis of 2007, 2008, in particular, the ways in which they made uh, profitable precisely the lack, right? So, and then not profitable in the sense that uh, allowing for the extraction of value, which was possible by the ways in which uh, produces and becoming uh, economic subjects. And I think in this moment, the figure that um, comes to me is the essential worker, the black or brown migrant uh, worker who cannot afford the, the, the kind of housing conditions uh, that would uh, you know, make this pandemic less deadly. Uh, those with, who are more likely to have pre-existing health conditions, those who cannot quit their jobs, right? Uh, in order to, you know, to hide at home like some of us can. So the, the very designation uh, essential workers keep some key economic sectors operative, that keeps some economic sectors operative during the, pan the pandemic is in my view operating as, uh, as a racial, uh, as a racial uh, machine. And, and I'm thinking here, for instance, in the case of Ontario, we're following it here from, from BC, uh, the fact that without paid sick leave, these workers are forced to go to work even if contaminated, which leads to the, that the disease are killing more of them, right? But the thing is, why are they essential, right? They're essential to watch, to whom? There is no challenge to this situation and because there is the assumption of necessity, which always works well with the uh, raciality. So there is no challenge to these situations and governments continue to um, put in place mitigation measures that have little impact upon the situation of these workers. It is as if they want to, the rest of us to stay home so there will be more hospital beds for those who must work to be contaminated. In any event, that, that there is a correspondence between high levels of mortality and morbidity from this infection and the condition of the colonial racial subaltern, in indigenous black people and Latinx. I mean, there is no, no question. So the social conditions, the health, income, employment, and housing situations behind these levels are not effect of um, uh, immediate factors, but they, are, but they accumulate the effects of layers and layers of deployments of racial difference over decades, which followed centuries of colonial expropriation of lands and bodies. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so I, I want to start with a, a note of temporality, if you will. Uh, in the region that I work with, the Caribbean, um, in our moment, is kind of complicated because that has been a form of colonial governance for hundreds of years, and the current moment is, is no exception. Uh, Haiti has already been mentioned as a reference to this, uh, where debt was imposed as a form, indeed, of revenge uh, on the first Black Republic. Um, and a revolution led by enslaved people in the Americans and the world. But also I can think of the Dominican Republic where the US seized the customs house in 1916 and President Roosevelt explicitly said that that was to clamp down the possibility of the nuclei of revolution. So just to say the past is not past. Over the last few years, I've been mostly working on Puerto Rico where debt also has a very long history as a form of colonial governance and capital extraction at multiple levels. In addition to genocide and enslavement, which has already been referenced, uh, during the 19th century, the Spanish government imposed the regime of the of notebook, de la, de la Libreta, which was a sort of, of labor coercive document um, that uh, uh, you had to know if you were working and it was a mechanism used uh, to capture uh, and extract uh, labor from people that were dispossessed by debt and, and property. 
not, not coincidentally, when the U.S. invaded Puerto Rico in, 19, in 1898, uh, bands of, of people would get together to burn the libretas. And later, labor day regimes continued in the 20th century, the infamous uh, paying back basically all of your salary to the uh, company store. In the second half of the 20th century, we have Puerto Rican households becoming soaked in debt as part of a new regime of consumer culture that sought to um, uh, create Puerto Rican indebted subjects in order to sell them uh, first world consumer products. And during that period, you could say that Puerto Rico became an indebted society, uh, not even just a class or not a racial group, uh, although obviously those differences also modulate who gets more indebted, but overall it, you know, Puerto Rico became an indebted society. Then more recently, I would say over the last decade and a half, Puerto Rico have become indebted nation uh, where the state apparatus has now been uh, uh, entrapped in this logic. And among the many punitive impacts, uh, because debt has been enormously efficient and, and changing things at a very quick rate, uh, one of them is the erosion of already very limited self-governance through legislation to uh, help with the debt imposed by the US government. Uh, local uh, uh, relative autonomy has been eroded by the imposition of a board, a fiscal control board that has veto power over elected officials. Um, the U.S. from the start has wanted to empty Puerto Rico from what they would call their surplus or excess labor. But what's amazing is that even the big migration or the great migration of the uh, second part of the 20th century is now paling in comparison to what the combination of debt, austerity, uh, and, and hurricane um, hitting a, a very weak infrastructure has, has produced, uh, which is now what they call, an, what we all call an emptying island. Um, which is now bringing another phenomenon that Puerto Rico had not had under the US uh, colonial rule, which is settlement of whites uh, uh, millionaires in Puerto Rico to take advantage of uh, very generous uh, tax conditions for people with a lot of money. Uh, we have increased poverty, hunger, and death due to deterioration of infrastructure, including medical infrastructure, also impacted by the uh, fleeing of medical personnel. We have massive closure of schools, massive housing foreclosures, rise in homelessness, and so forth. So we could make a very even longer list than this, but the impacts in a very short period of time, you could say of uh, the, an austerity regime uh, in Puerto Rico has actually been able to accomplish things that had not been able to accomplish by other configurations of colonial governance in the prior hundred years. And why be concerned about that? Well, Puerto Rico has historically had the role of laboratory. And to some extent, I think we see the potential of uh, an indebted future at all levels of society uh, being expanded throughout the world and accompanied by a reproduction of coloniality uh, also at all levels and a very a necropolitical uh, undercurrent of the project of this neo neoliberalism. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the second question, either in relation to the example you just noted, or more broadly, can you explain how weaponized unpayable debt came to be? What forces converge to institute and enforce it? So if we start with Max this time. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, I've been curious about how, um, on the one hand, uh, revenge uh, how debt acts vengefully on subjects who are rendered indebted. And here I'm thinking particularly not of those for whom debts are enabling, such as, you know, um, the elect entrepreneurs who can borrow money and have it um, help them improve either their human capital or their uh, capital accumulation projects, but those who are imposed with unpayable debts. So I'm curious about how we can think about the way that a system takes revenge that's maybe quite different from the way that people take revenge. And maybe to back up for a moment, uh, what I'm trying to think through is that we, our notion of what revenge is, is already, I'm suggesting, shaped by a system that is taking revenge. So capitalism as a system, and particularly this kind of racial capitalist imperialism that has been with us for these last 500 years, um, 
is, is one that of course depends on specific acts of vengeance of the ruling class against those whom it must oppress and exploit. And it's also a system that has, has not failed to mobilize certain segments of the oppressed and exploited, notably the white segments, to take revenge on other segments of the exploited and the oppressed as a kind of um, uh, part of sort of the wages of whiteness, what Du Bois called the wages of whiteness. There is a sense that anti, uh, like racist forms of mob vengeance uh, that we are seeing reprised now in, in recent times are a kind of um, revenge that acts in this way as a kind of um, psychic wage uh, with, of course, horrifying and horrific impacts. And yet that type of specific forms of revenge that allow capitalism to reproduce itself through violence are also joined by the kinds of systemic and structural revenge that seem to have no rhyme, reason, or agent. And so here I think the horrific uh, impacts of climate change, which I mentioned before, are a great example. No particularly villainous CEO is trying to, you know, disgorge uh, fossil fuels into, uh, burn fossil fuels to release um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to murder and displace millions of people. It's something that emerges from the inter-capitalist competition that's at the heart of the kind of capitalist system and its strange forms of dynamic equilibrium. And that system, because it's based on the singular acts of revenge that assume that there is a debt that is owed to the powerful from the oppressed, and the system that takes this kind of mass anonymous revenge, that system together, I think, um, creates the mythology of debt and the debt of the oppressed as a way to in some way legitimate uh, its operations in, by saying that those around the world who have, are on whose uh, exploitation it depends owe a debt to those who oppress them. It can quite neatly obfuscate the actual form of revenge that's going on. And then comes a final maneuver where those who are oppressed, exploited and indebted by this system are then blamed or accused of being pathologically, nihilistically vengeful, uncivilized and un incapable of fully entering into uh, the capitalist moral economy because they would seek to claim debts to which they have no rights. Um, Denise, if you'd like to go next. Okay, nice surprise. Um, I, um, well, so I can't, uh, my answer to the first question, I can't, I can't explain how, um, how, it, how it's being weaponized. And because I think uh, this unpayable debt is constitutive of capital and um, and then as such, it is, I mean, capital is, is the, the weapon, but I think we are all in agreement with that. So, but basically I just want to say that um, my, in my view, unpayable that for me is this image that, um, that allowed to capture the ways in which uh, blackness uh, operates in the post enlightenment political architecture. And it's an image um, inspired by Walter Benjamin's uh, dialectical image and then when, that's, when that image is deployed, and I think we kind of do it, even if indirectly, when it's deployed, it has the capacity to unravel uh, several things. The limits of the existing explanation for social subjugation, whether it's racial, gender, sex, race, gender, sexuality, uh, it, it unravels the fact that as long as the social is described as away from the economic, we never quite get to uh, the core of that which has rendered um, capital uh, has enabled capital to survive and and foster uh, whether or not it is through revenge or reward. I think sometimes it rewards um, too. Um, so that's all I want to say, actually, <laughs> since I went over time last time. <laughs> uh, Francis. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to first uh, re um, dialogue a little bit with Ma what Max said. Um, I I've been doing a little bit of research on uh, the um, term of revenge as it correlates with debt. And I, and I found very interestingly that including in images like literal images, uh, there is um, 
an association with the revenge of the oppressed, as you, as Max put it, uh, where, whether the states uh, or the, the powerful may retaliate, the, the uh, oppressed have revenge. <laughs> Um, and um, and I think this actually uh, uh, fits my argument uh, I made in the Empty Island about um, some of the components of uh, the debt regime becoming the new form of extraction after agricultural, after manufacturing, is the expulsion of the U.S. military from Vieques. Um, from 2003, uh, when a, a social movement basically evicted uh, the, the, the U.S. Navy from Vieques and other facilities, um, there seemed to have been a, a crisis for capital and for the U.S. state about what to do with Puerto Rico as a site or extraction. Um, and the solution to that was debt extraction. So it has like we already uh, have gone through uh, exploitation of uh, natural resources, agricultural resources, uh, manufacturing, extraction of labor. So now we're just gonna take it all uh, through this mechanism. And I think there is an element of revenge on the success of social movements in Puerto Rico to in some way humiliate the United States by a, a group of you know, uh, colonial subjects being able to uh, remove the world's most powerful military from its territory. Um, I've started to do some work, so I, it's tentative about what are the specific uh, political actors and assemblages of power operating that made this imposition of debt uh, um, relatively easy to impose. Uh, and obviously, with this a colonial legal framework uh, in the case of Puerto Rico that actually says that debt has to be serviced above all things. Uh, and that was uh, an element of, of the constitution that wasn't there before the 1980s. Um, uh, you also have a facilitating elite that had incorporated uh, uh, neoliberalism logics as its own common sense, uh, at least since the 1990s, uh, and that saw the that very limited vision of a project, saw that its only role in this process could be uh, serving to facilitate basically the sale of everything uh, to uh, US capital. Uh, and in fact, I, I wondered uh, at certain moments before this juncture, uh, what was the uh, local elites um, role in this? And it has been precisely what I thought, which was to facilitate selling everything off. Um, so uh, it, I think it's useful just to close that uh, examining both uh, larger dynamics, but also what are the specific dynamics in a locality because uh, an understanding of that facilitates certain types of interventions that uh, are necessary to disrupt these logics. Thanks so much. It's way cooler to go last than first because you get to hear all of these, all of these um, really important things that, that folks are saying. I guess, you know, to this question of um, when, how is debt weaponized? How is unpayable debt weaponized? I, there are, it's a question that's that's too big to answer in a lot of ways. And there, there are literally innumerable ways, moments, places from which to answer it, right? As Francis and all of all of your all of your answers have said. But what I so I'm just I thought two came to me, right? So one, I'm channeling the work of K. Sue Park here, which is the use of the mortgage instrument, right, to dispossess Native North Americans. Right, so you have, you know, in the archives of the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, but many others too the explicit idea that using the mortgage to have people put up their land as collateral will be um, a kind of licit way, right? Of enact a legal way, a legal mechanism through which to enact dispossession, right? Its own form of radical racist financial violence. And it's what Cheryl Harris talks about in that classic whiteness as property, right? And she cites de Tocqueville there who says, the dispossession of the Native Americans happen completely within the realm of the law precisely because whiteness as property, whiteness is acting as law in that moment. So I think of that as a kind of foundational moment of the current global capitalist regime. That's a foundational moment of the weaponization of debt. And then much more recently, and we actually write about it in the Can't Pay, Won't Pay book, you know, thinking about debt in the criminal punishment system more broadly, obviously thinking about Dante Wright, but thinking also about um, Ferguson, Missouri, where Michael Brown was killed and Black Lives Matter rose up. When you look at the municipal court system in Ferguson, Missouri, which after 
decades of state subsidized white flight. So white folks are leaving, the tax base is leaving, right? And you see a majority black city with a radically diminished tax base. How are they making up that money? Through debtors' prisons. They're fucking arresting people. They're charging them fees. They're constantly getting them in and out and they have to pay their court fees. They have to pay their probation fees. They have to pay, right? So it's another way in which debt is weaponized in part, it pays the salaries of the, of the clerks and stuff, right? Because taxes are no longer pay, able to pay for the lawyers and able to pay for the judges. But I actually think that it's really important, and I hear it in this question of weaponization and unpayable, to be sure that we notice that sometimes, lots of times, debt is just as much about control as it is about repayment at a profit right? The prison industrial complex, by and large, is not fucking making anybody any money, excuse my language, right? This is Ruthie Gilmore's really powerful critique of the kind of over-focus on the private, right? It is so much more, it is radically expensive to do this, and it indebts hundreds of thousands of people. So the average person who's incarcerated comes out just with fines and fees, not even bail, $16,000. That's not making anybody any money, right? It's just a method of racist social control. So I just, I think it's actually Zizek, at least that's where I originally saw that phrase, debt is as much about power and control as it is about repayment as a profit. So noticing those moments in which the profit mode, the debt is literally just acting as like straight up weaponization, straight up racist control without profiting other people, I think is also a really useful um, distinction to make sometimes when we, when we need to. Great, thank you so much. And so the third question is, how has unpayable debt, in this specific case you have noted, or more generally, been resisted? How have these modes of resistance been effective? Um, so if we could start with Denise this time. Uh, yes, and I think um, I'm going to uh, start from where Hannah just finished, even though it's a bit uh, more general, because um, I'm thinking about the revenge and reward. Um, so when you ask for when you ask, you get rights. Reward when you protest, you get bullets. So it's been resisted since you know 1492, right to today. Whether the different forms of indigenous peoples attacks on conquerors and settlers, slaves, revolts and sabotage, abolitionist campaigns, independence movements, civil rights movements, movements for equality, recognition, human rights. So these movements have been as effective as they have been ineffective but they forced reconfigurations of the liberal colonial state capital, which were obviously always partial because the central feature and mode of operation of state capital had not been fully disorganized and hasn't precisely because for the most part, these movements demanded to remain within, within the base configuration, whether through uh, the position as citizen when we demand for demand rights or as people uh, demanding sovereignty. Um, Thanks, Denise. Um, Francis? Uh, yes, at first I wanna say something to what Hannah mentioned uh, to, uh, to add to that, which I also think not only uh, it's not expected to be paid in some instances, um, but I do also think that it has a, yet another uh, possible dimension uh, that is that it helps to reconstitute relations of power between capital sectors uh, and, uh, and between subordinate sectors. Um, so for instance, uh, to have a debt crisis uh, gives a, a, a tremendous amount of more power in all kinds of ways to these sectors of capital. Uh, so in that sense, I, I see that unpayable debts are also critical to reassembling uh, relations of power. Uh, but to the question at hand, um, a lot of what I've been doing over the last few years has been uh, mapping and tracking some of these uh, ways of resistance. And I, I like to make a bit of a list because uh, when you are, have a debt nation, you know, the, the ways of resisting have taken many, many forms, right? Um, so for, uh, I would say the dominant form is what people would call autogestion. Um, uh, um, assuming uh, self-governance, uh, I mean, the English translation to autogestion is actually doesn't quite grasp the, all the dimensions of it. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, creating new ways of being, uh, things that are, quote unquote, in your hands. Um, and 
it being that a, a general framework, there are multiple other components. So for instance, one of the impressive things that have happened is the activation of diasporic networks into um, addressing questions of dispossession and, and, and circulating resources. Uh, so if you think about the, the diaspora as a group of people that were expelled uh, for various reasons, including indebtedness, um, using the same infrastructures of expulsion, such as planes, you know, and, and, and the, the resources that people have been able to uh, consolidate in a diasporic, uh, under diasporic conditions to support and, and in, the, in the process creating new ways of thinking, belonging and political activity. Uh, also Marunash, I would say, I mean, a lot of people have uh, kind of uh, fled, if you will, even the fight against the state uh, to create other types of organizations, communities under different bases. And I would say a number of agricultural in, uh, initiatives uh, in Puerto Rico and elsewhere in Latin America uh, follow this. Um, you also have mass mobilizations that have been very, at least very successful in the campaign to uh, um, bring down the, the Greek leader Ricardo Rosselló, the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, also targeted campaigns uh, that uh, seek, for instance, to audit the debt. Um, there were a number of assemblies uh, for the first time, uh, uh, island-wide assemblies for communities to talk, identify what the challenges that they saw were important and how to meet them. Um, an enormous amount of art, um, uh, artivisms, um, community-based um, that are also often intertwined with these other elements. So you might have a space that uh, does um, provide a space for artists, but also uh, provides opportunity to um, equip the community with solar power um, and, uh, and, and other resources. Uh, have they been effective? Uh, as far as um, cohering uh, a project to disrupt the fundamental or, or the most ingrained logics that organize the system at large. I would say that's still going on, but I would say that most definitely uh, these um, various ways of resisting the debt regime have generated frameworks for that possibility to exist in the future. And producing a desendeudada, as Veronica Gago, uh, Lucy Caraballo would call uh, subjectivity, which refuses debt and, and, uh, and refuses the assumption that a colonial possession uh, owes uh, the state or owes its corporations anything. Uh, so in that sense, I think one of the biggest contributions of the current moment uh, from all these uh, activities is that, uh, uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, a Nicaraguan um, uh, revolutionary from the 19th, uh, late 1970s, we will never be cattle again. You know, uh, there is a bit of a, a turning point uh, in that sense. Okay, so I think I'm next and I love to talk about organizing. I'm so happy we've gotten to the second two questions. So I'm gonna talk about our work um, at the Debt Collective. And as I said, at the Debt Collective, we organize debtors unions. So it's based on this provocation that alone, our debts are isolating. Alone, our debts feel shameful. Alone, our debts feel terrified, right? My debt alone is I'm not gonna pick up that phone call because I know it's a debt collector. I'm not gonna open that piece of mail because I know it's a bill that I cannot pay that is unpayable for me but together our debts make us powerful, right? And it's based on the same idea as a labor union, right? Alone, if I go to my boss and be like, I want a, way, I want a raise and I want a weekend and I don't want there to be you know, child labor next to me, but my boss is gonna be like, fuck off, leave. But if I organize with everybody else on my factory floor or in my teacher's union, right? Then we actually have some power to collectively withhold labor or at least threaten it to come to the table to renegotiate the terms. Capitalism shapeshifts. And now that we all systemically, but radically unequally hold so much household debt, we have a tremendous amount of leverage over this system in our hands. And if you don't wanna take it from me, you can take it from J John Paul Getty, this you know, very famous capitalist who once said, you know, if you owe the bank hundred dollars, that's your problem. You owe the bank, you have to pay that. But if you owe the bank hundred million dollars, you own the bank, right? This is how wealthy people, this is how corporations understand debt. This is how it enriches them. They understand it as a terrain of political struggle. And that has to be a political tool that we as debtors also use. 
So that's what we do at the at the debt collective. I would say the in terms of successes, you know, the first debtors union that we organize that's in an ongoing campaign is folks who held debts from for-profit colleges. So far, that strike, that union has generated over two billion dollars in student debt abolition. So that's not only debts that they were supposed to pay in the future that they now no longer have to pay. Those are also refund checks from the federal government and also the proposal of a federal law written by Pramila Jayapal um, and uh, oh my gosh, Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar and Pramila Jayapal called College for All that Bernie Sanders ended up picking up and is actually going back to committee this week. And I think, you know, beyond, you know, $2 billion, which is just a drop in the bucket, sadly, compared to the 1.7 trillion in student debt alone, but beyond that $2 billion in debt abolition, beyond that proposed federal, federal legislation, I think we can all see just in the terrain of student debt, which my family has about $80,000 of, a radical change in the national narrative, which is to say even like crazy right-wing Republicans have to have a position on it. Whereas before this union started, nobody was even talking about it, right? When we're talking about it at Occupy Wall Street, people are laughing at us, people are saying it's ridiculous. And I guess the last thing that I'll say is that needless to say, like, the collective power of debt leverage, right, the power of a debtors union is not only to abolish debt, but it is the power to make demands on the system as such, which is to say it cannot be financed this way anymore in the future, right? So if we refuse to pay, we are also saying that there has to be public college again, but not just for white men, which is when there was public college, at least in this country, right? So it's not only using the power and using the leverage to say abolish the debt, but to say that on the back end, that system has to change or else we're just gonna get back into the same system again. And college for all, indeed, that bill, it's not only a discharge of what's now actually up at 1.8 trillion, I think, um, but it's also to say that that public college has to be uh, free again, that it has to be tuition free, which is what public college used to mean. I always say, you know, I teach in the UC, the University of California system, and I always say, hat tip to Prince, that I work in a formerly public college um, and university system, right? Because we don't we don't have public school anymore, at least in this country, and that's something that I think is really worth fighting for. So. I see the potential of debtors unions, and I will say I also see them at scale. We write quite a bit about it in the book, but it is to say that it can also work um, across uh, national lines because precisely because these financial institutions work across national lines. So this isn't, you know, it is to say if we could get a union of everybody, you have to organize, you can organize unions by creditors, right? So if you get a union that organizes against JP Morgan Chase and some people are able to withhold mortgage payments while other people are able to withhold sovereign debt payments while other people, right? I mean, it's just that creditor holds all kinds of different debts. So that's our kind of horizon of possibility and what we're organizing around, but we have, you know, much more kind of um, domestic campaigns that have, have seen some some real success and that I feel really um, excited about. Um, yeah, I just want to say I'm so impressed by what you folks in Debt Collective have done over the last, uh, last 10 years, really, since, since Occupy Wall Street. And, and now that debt uh, elimination is actually on the agenda at the at the national level in the United States is incredible. So just huge kudos for doing that, and also to in in way where you finish there, Hannah, um, just to recall the kind of dream that was uh, decapitated of uh, Thomas Sankara of a kind of international debt strike, debt union. He was thinking in terms of indebted states in Africa and and throughout the global south, but. It's such an interesting and promising way of thinking about what connects us uh, as a as a species that, as Sylvia Winter points out, needs to begin to tell new stories about what it is and take responsibility for its uh, for what it's going to become. I wanted to take my few minutes here to 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 speculate a bit wildly, and I'm not sure if I'm correct about this, but I wanted to think about if we can use the analysis of refusal of debt to understand some of the features of movements that we don't commonly associate with debt. So the first one, and here I'm drawing on Denise's work as well as Sadia Hartman's, is to maybe think about the incredible and powerful uprising against uh, like uh, completely, uh, complete police impunity and the, the murder of black people in the United States and elsewhere indeed as a way of fighting back against the way that specifically black people, but 
also racialized people have been cast by capitalist modernity as perpetually and fatally indebted subjects, subjects who have a debt to pay to society for some freedom that is alleged to have been granted and who are then also cast as subjects who cannot pay and are therefore rendered killable and unmournable. And I wonder if those movements then can also, in addition to the many other ways that they express themselves, be conceived of as a movement against debt of a certain sort. I'm also wondering about other movements, and, and this comes from my talking with a lot of my students about the movements that they're interested in and involved in. And I think a lot of them have to do with a refusal of a logic of debt, personal debt, which is connected very intimately in this system to notions of capitalist success and uh, what it means to be successful and the idea that you should go into debt to invest in yourself, to invest in your community, to invest, you know, literally a, in order to succeed. And I think, for instance, about the incredible work that young people are doing right now around mental health, for instance, and refusing the logics of mental health that insists that you must invest in yourself in order to compete on a market to succeed through debt. Or I think, for instance, about um, Jack Halberstam's work on the queer art of failure and the queer refusals of success as a way of refusing the imperative to go into debt in order to try and achieve a certain level or measure of success. And I think about, of course, the movements that are very intimate to us here in Thunder Bay and across the territories we currently call Canada of indigenous refusal. And of course, authors like Sheree Pasternak, Alyosha Goldstein and others have pointed out Kesu Park, who was mentioned before, that indigenous subjugation and the, the colonization of land in, uh, in uh, Turtle Island, and Catherine, your own work on uh, Eoteriora in uh, what is now known by many as New Zealand, indicates that debt has always been this weapon that has reinscribed colonial relationships, not through exclusion, but now through different modes of predatory inclusion. Thank you. And so for the fourth question of the round, what is the promise and what are the perils of movements for liberation insisting on the recognition or restitution of unpayable debts owed to them? Is this playing out in the example you offered? Can the books be balanced? Um, so if we could start with uh, Francis this time. Well, uh, actually, I want to very quickly just say that um, right now I'm working, uh, I work, uh, part of a working group uh, that is doing a mapping project to, to uh, see what the um, volume of uh, debt being held uh, throughout the Americas um, in order to keep strengthening narratives and possibilities of collaboration internationally. Uh, since as we know, as, as Anna mentioned, I, we know that the debt is held pretty much by the same people. Uh, if you could coordinate efforts in multiple locations uh, beyond one nation state, uh, that could potentially be a game changer on that front. Um, so to the very briefly to the question, I, I don't think they can be balanced. I mean, the very vocabulary of balancing the books already puts a limit as Max was uh, saying earlier. Um, I also wanna note that um, revenge uh, in the Caribbean has often uh, as, as, as symptomatic of as a tactic of popular outrage has often been made by meant by even greater and more intense violence uh, therefore uh, having a role in certain junctures but perhaps not necessarily being uh, a, a way forward um, the second thing is uh, I don't think the harms that have been done uh, a, a good number of them if not most of them can be undone um, so, and to focus on those terms uh, with those tactics, I think uh, would do a, another kind of harm, which is robbing us of our joy uh, in many ways. Uh, so apart from the, the many ways that I think people are, are resisting that imaginatively and so forth, um, I, I concur with uh, Hannah uh, in, in the sense that um, more broadly in the sense that I think there is in, in many different contexts and also what Max was saying, many different contexts, uh, you can organize around multiple spaces that are interrelated with the debt regime, even though it's not overtly financialized in a, in a strategy to peel off uh, uh, multiple layers of the ways that this regime is operating. So in a colonial context like Puerto Rico, you know, we're talking about everything from um, laws that uh, impose certain types of, uh, you know, for instance, using the merchant marine uh, of the U.S. to move 
all uh, uh, products into Puerto Rico, which makes uh, food very expensive, for instance. Um, uh, past legislation that uh, assures equitable access to existing resources that people in all the territories do not have, for instance, SSI or Medicare. Um, and, and demanding um, um, a comprehensive package of, of uh, addressing more than 122 years of colonial uh, capitalist dispossession. And even although I am, you know, often skeptical of, uh, you know, the discourses around citizenship, but I think in certain junctures, even extending full citizenship rights to territorial citizens um, might be uh, part of, uh, you know, the, the three elements of reparations, restitution, uh, and reimagining as core components of, of going forward. Um, so it's not the solution by any means, uh, but any, uh, any number of actions that can address problems that affect people's life and well-being, I think should be pursued at the same time that we are uh, reimagining uh, and uh, pra in, in practice, uh, creating new forms of being and relating to self and others. I've lost the order. Am I next? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're next. Okay. okay. Yeah, so this question of promise and peril. Um, <clears throat> so as was perhaps obvious from my last answer, I think there is a tremendous amount of promise um, in organizing around debt. And I think that for, for many reasons, but I'll name two of them. One is, again, because as capitalism shapeshifts and fewer and fewer of us share workplaces, which is to say we don't share the spatial geographies that allow us to organize together, but we do more and more of us share creditors in ways that are not yet fully clear to us. I, I will not use the word transparent, right? There is a tremendous amount of power in waiting, right? And to me, when I think of promise, I think of building power. Like I do not want to fuck around. Like I want to build power because that is really, we have to build really substantial anti-capitalist, anti-racist counter power. And I think debt gives us a terrain on which to do that. So some of the promise along the way is to get some of the debts abolished. But as this panel makes so clear, so many of the debts are unpayable, right? So yeah, part of it is about debt abolition. Part of it is a get about getting money back in the pockets of poor working class people, disproportionately black, brown, indigenous, absolutely. But part of it is also the idea of debt just as a, as, a, as a mechanism to generate huge power to then do what we want, right? To have leverage over a system, to have mass refusal over a system that we can then also reimagine and reinvest in and recreate together. So it's kind of a paradoxical example, but it will lead me to the second, the, the peril thing that I wanna say. You know, we often think at the Debt Collective about the aftermath of 2008, 2009, which has come up here several times. When imagine as a counterfactual, had there been a mortgage holders union at that time? We know in the wake of 2008, 2009, the black and Latinx families in the US disproportionately lost what is their, high, their highest value asset, right? Which is their home. So imagine that there had been a mortgage holders union at that time and mortgage holders started reaching out to their union reps and were like, oh my God, my adjustable rate mortgage just blew up. I can't pay or my home is underwater, right? And union reps from across the country start hearing about this as the financial markets also start realizing that the mortgage-backed securities markets are looking shaky. Then we, the union can say, we will threaten to withhold all mortgage payments until you write down every single one of these mortgages and get rid of all those racist lending terms, Wells Fargo and everybody, right? So that has a tremendous amount of promise. Now. Part of the peril in that is let's just notice that I was talking about a mortgage holders union and private property is a cornerstone of capitalism, right? So the peril to me is that is the, the difficulty organizing a debtor's union when capitalism has its tentacles so deeply in us, whether that's the fear about our credit score, whether that's the fact that the only way for some of us to build any kind of intergenerational wealth is through hope to get into hope, hope of ownership, right? Hope to get into a real estate market because maybe if we're able to buy a house, then maybe we'll be able to afford our, to pay for our kids to go to college when it's when that time comes. So I think the peril is trying to build power 
and trying to make meaningful change, material change in all of our lives, while at the same time having the unrelentingly creative and critical critique and reimagining, right? Critique of capitalism and reimagining of something else. Like holding those at the same time to me is the kind of nexus of potential and peril. Yeah, I'm also very excited by those prospects uh, that Hannah mentioned. Um, and, and also I wanna come back to um, what Francis was saying too about a lot of the promise here being people turning away from the economy that produced the debt and these, these strategies, tactics and movements of autogestion of, of, of creating a different world anew. And it brings me to the, the point that I think, and this is a point that I think was made very beautifully by Andrew Ross in his book about uh, debt some years ago, that like when we speak about resisting debt, we're not resist speaking about like this kind of libertarian fantasy of living in a world where nobody owes anything to anyone, but one where we are free to and uh, capacitated to um, create different kinds of social bonds, to create different forms of dependency, to create different forms of care, uh, to use that term in its broadest sense, not only between human actors, but also human actors and non-human actors. Uh, the world that we live in that right now we have a kind of, we're forced into an extractive relationship to, and also a relationship uh, of, of, of uh, bonds between ancestors and those yet to come as well, which, you know, is something that's very commonly uh, framed in Anishinaabe cosmologies here in uh, Anishinaabe territory where I live. Um, so all of those are very exciting. I have a few questions uh, about how we might organize around debt. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't have good answers for them. The first is that I think one of the things that leads to the success of movements is when it offers their participants a sense of a, a heroic or triumphant, or at least potential we, a commonality, something that we are and a way of telling a story about ourselves. And I'm curious about the ways that debt being commonly indebted can lead to those kind of narratives. And if those narratives can be compelling uh, on a mass basis and under what conditions they can be compelling on a mass basis. But my more uh, squirmy question <laughs> is I'm, I'm worried that debt elimination or debt forgiveness, depending on how you frame it, uh, is such a good idea that it is likely to be appropriated by the far right. And in fact, already is being appropriated by the far right in some places. I mean, famously, uh, the Nazis rose to power on their uh, promise to ignore the debts that Germany owed to Europe and to expropriate the racialized others whom they, you know, specifically Jews who they saw as um, responsible for Germany's debt. So there's a way that there's a lot, there's also this kind of history of debt, of anti-debt politics from the right that, and I wanna connect that to then the context here in the part of Turtle Island currently known as Canada, where the Canadian government is very eager to settle its debt with indigenous people to, you know, this government specifically of Trudeau came in on the promise to abide by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and settle the indigenous problem once and for all with all of the nefarious implications that my framing of the term just, uh, you know, implied. Um, and so there's a real eagerness by the Canadian state to say, what would it take? How much money would it take? What kind of policies would it take for you indigenous people to go away and for us to settle this debt? And I think the really interesting thing that's happening now is that I think, uh, especially but not exclusively, young Indigenous uh, activists are saying there isn't enough money in this country to settle the debt because the country that built the money is built on the um, theft and expropriation of our lands. So demanding the land back becomes a way of demanding a kind of unpayable, uh, demanding the unpayability, the, the potential unpayability of that debt in an interesting way. Um, okay, I think I am uh, closing this, this one. Um, so the militant in me, it's like, yes, uh, we, need, um, we need to organize to refuse to pay, to refuse uh, to buy, but we, we also need, I think we need to ask different questions, right? Um, and then at the same time that we 
must exist, protest, resist. Um, we also should um, image existence otherwise than, than state capital. So, but how to reformulate the questions or how to ask the different questions? I don't know. So I'm just gonna say something about how not to, and that will be it. Um, I think, of course, it is about several things, but also rewriting our critical apparatus because that critical apparatus is what enables us to even delineate that us or we that um, I think Max was talking about and, and such the configuration um, the, the, this reconfiguration, at least as I see it from here, it should center coloniality and, and raciality. And so, but then how, how it could go, you know, because it's about how we think. And I'm saying I'm going to spend more than 30 minutes, but I think I have some, I have some in the bank. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So for instance, it could remain within uh, the limits of the liberal framework and the most explicit aspects of it. And the demand would be one for the distribution. Uh, of course, that happens after the acknowledgement that exclusion has taken place and that of uneven opportunities. But that could be made without um, attending to how the very, the accumulative machine has been built thanks to the, recompos the decomposition of what's being extracted from, um, to use the terms of the anti-colonial literature from native lands and enslaved, enslaved bodies. And historical materialist version, uh, you know, if it attended to coloniality and raciality, it would have to be adjusted in terms of how it accounts of, in terms of its account of this exchange value, it would have to include both slave labor and raw materials and the calculation of surplus value. And if we try to do it, I promise you, the whole thing explodes. So I don't know how it would survive that. But we, you know, just think of the US in the early 20th century, descendants of yesterday's natives and slaves were excluded from the privileged side of capital from industrial production. Um, and then later African-Americans did make inroads for the most part, um, but then, you know, Today, you no, know, four in every, you no know, one in every four black person is in the system. Well, Hannah has described also the many, many ways in which these unpayable debt remains profitable, um, you know, in the form of bail and, and fees. I know the point I think is that privileging the living, privileging of living labor as producer of surplus labor would not hold, and at the same time there is a need uh, to account of for how coloniality and raciality remain in the production of value and now in that production through financial speculation. So anyway, I just wanna finish saying that I think the whole point what I'm trying to do here and there is a critique of um, the very basis, the conceptual basis under which we organized but more importantly, I'm just reminding us that um, we can't separate the economic, when you're speaking about value, looking at value, we can't separate the economic and the ethical. I know we know that, but it's, um, but it is important to highlight that factor because if not, then it's beyond, beyond property as um, Hannah was saying, it is property and property says it's always being tied to liberty. And as long as that connection remains and we are organizing for liberty, uh, I think we just, it's self-defeating. Um. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I do have a couple of questions of my own, but there's there's one that's been posted in the chat, which I think leads on quite nicely from what you were saying, Max, about the kinds of risks of um, abolition of debt being co-opted by the right. Um, and the question is uh, just here, it's, um, who cares if we get rid of debt when we just have to start over fresh in the same system, right? And I think this kind of points to quite a few things in um, your work, like Hannah, I know for your project, like it's not just about abolition of debt, you know, um, there's kind of more to it. And and Max, you've spoken about, you know, maybe there's some sorts of debts which it's actually not constructive to think about their abolition or their final settlement. It might be more constructive to think of them in a different way. Um, so I wonder if um, you could speak to that. I mean. I'll, I'll leave this question open to whoever wants to have a go at answering it. Yeah, I can just say really concretely from the perspective of 
the organizing that we do. So for example, a student debtors union is never just about the abolition of student debt, because if the system that produced that student debt isn't changed on the back end, then we would just be back in the same situation again, right? So the demands of that particular union have always been abolish the debt and make public college, reparative public college free again, right? Which is to say tuition free. And I saw the Bernie comment in the chat. And it, so it goes too with medical debt. So it goes to with housing debt, right? The demand has to be not only the debt abolition, but using that same power, using that same leverage to imagine and create alternatives on the back end. I will just say there's a meaningful distinction when it comes to debt in the criminal punishment system, which is that you don't, that, that debt abolition, and we, we tend to use the word abolition, debt abolition in the criminal punishment system is obviously not about making prison and jail free, right? It, it, it is a non-reformist reform on the way to abolition, which it, it is to say, it's like the kind of step-by-step -step divestment from the prison industrial complex. But absolutely, that the demand has to be there from the beginning. But then it, it takes us to Denise's, and everybody was saying a version of this, but Denise's great question of like, how, how much does the demand have to stay within the liberal framework? right? We do not want the demand to stay within the liberal framework, but what is legible to people, right? To see Alexander's question in the chat, what is legible to people that will bring them on, right? To say social housing, socialized education, social, social healthcare, right? It is within the realm of, of the liberal, right? It is not radically anti-capitalist, but, and so what does it mean always as organizers and as we're doing our political ed and stuff like to have those radical horizons always there, but to be taking step by step, because frankly, were there public college in this country? Were there public health care in this country? Were there public socialized housing in this country? Would we be, at, be better off? I think we would. Would we still be within a realm of sort of liberal white supremacy? Arguably, yes, right? So how do you reconcile the kind of, the the, the scales of systemic change that you need to demand as you're organizing now and the sort of visions of systemic change. But I'll just say from the debt collector perspective, it's never just about abolishing debt or else it doesn't, it doesn't change the system that created it in the first place. Can I just say something quickly? Um, and it's not so much, but just adding to what Hannah was saying and con connecting to what Max was saying in terms of because it is also about the horizon, isn't it? It's about what's guiding uh, the demand. And I think if we begin with the demand from indigenous peoples for the land back, the impossible demand, the, impo the, the demand that is impossible to meet as the debt is unpayable, I think that may provide a different horizon for beginning to think then. So what does it mean right, to think about that? Just, just along those lines that um, each context, I mean, each context has different demands uh, in the sense of how to think about debt, what is the contour of debt. And there's also different um, epistemological uh, traditions of conceiving what is debt and, and so forth. So in that sense, we, uh, a context that uses debt abolition and that is, uh, makes sense uh, given the, what is the fight and what is the, the contours of it. Uh, might not be the same or have the same effects or be the desirable way to frame it in another context. So in that sense, uh, the point would be that we need a plurality of, of ways to think about it, uh, giving the, the various different kinds of unpayable debts that uh, communities, groups, and so forth are maybe uh, facing. Well, maybe only add very quickly that I've only had very limited experience as an organizer around debt and my experiences were very unsuccessful um, because I was trying, I think, to organize around, you know, the, many of the things that have been mentioned here. Um, and I guess one of the things I learned and I'm still trying to process is that in a weird way, sometimes people make demands that appear very reformist as a way to get into a much more radical demand. So, you know, some people might be afraid of uh, the demand to cancel all debts or eliminate all debts because there, there's, and I think this happens on both a personal level and broader levels, because their sense of dignity has been educated within a regime of debts. So being unable to pay back your debt is shameful. And somehow, I think that if we look at the history of social movements, often they organize themselves around demands that at first seem very strange, very, very reformist. And yet underneath that, 
there's a kind of tectonics that sometimes function that allow people to come together around something that seems reasonable um, and dignifying and then realizing as they struggle for that that it that actually the, the issue is much bigger and broader Great. Um, so one of the questions that I had is sort of around uh, the place of the subject in this um, and political subjectivity. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I'm sort of coming at it from a settler colonial context, which is where I grew up in Aotearoa. Um, so I'm kind of particularly interested in how this reframing of deficit as, um, as unpayability kind of supports particular kinds of political subjectivity but also maybe like challenges, poses new challenges for kind of existing political subjects like the working class subject and the settler subject, these kind of traditional um, subject categories. Um, I guess related to that and to what Max said, um, before the debt crisis um, in Puerto Rico, the dominant hegemonic uh, discourse that was widely shared by many people living in Puerto Rico was that um, the US uh, was uh, uh, providing the resources for which without, you could not live. And one of the things that the debt crisis uh, did that promoted a different subjectivity and different discourses and, and a bit of the tectonics that Max was referring to underneath was that in examining the debt crisis, people literally, uh, a bit like uh, Hannah's map at the beginning, went in to see the flows of money coming in from the state and the flows of money coming out from corporations uh, and uh, extraction from Wall Street and concluded the obvious, uh, which had not been obvious before, is that there's much more extraction than there is money coming in. Whereas before that horizon was not available and it was produced precisely by the fact that the debt was no longer now held by households, but by the, the, the government of Puerto Rico itself, implicating every level of uh, everyday life, right? Um, so that I think is a, a, an example of uh, the intersection of all these uh, um, junctures that have been mentioned uh, uh, unfolding right now, right, in a particular context. Would anyone else like to jump, jump in on that or should I move to another question? Um, I guess I can jump in. I don't, I, so I hear the question as like, what does this framework of what kinds of political subjectivities does this framework of unpayable debt make available? And I just wanna pick up something that Denise was saying in her last answer, which is that to me, the land back demand right? The horizon demand, and it actually goes to, to somebody in the chat who was asking about alternative forms of ownership. Um, I think that naming the unpayable debt by keeping the horizon explicitly at the land back demand allows for a kind of radical opening that in terms of organizing is much more long-term, right? But it, but is, is the necessary horizon. So by that, I mean, you know, very often in, a, in the kind of liberal framework of organizing to have sort of major but legible wins, it's like, okay, well, there's private ownership and you're arguing for public ownership, right? This is privatized and you're kind of either explicitly or implicitly arguing for some public form. But what are all those things in the middle, right? So Public housing, for example, has been one of the, the sites of the most racialized violent policing in our country and many other countries' history. Do we wanna be like more public housing? Yay, HUD. No, obviously not, right? The fucking cops, that's public too. So the land back demand, which is to say a kind of radical rethinking of this concept of, own it's not a transfer of ownership, right? It's a radical rethinking of the concept of ownership in the first place, opens up all of this space, this proliferative space between the nominally private and the nominally public to talk about social ownership, right? Versus public ownership. What is social housing and how is social housing different from public housing? What does worker ownership look like? Not privately owned, not state owned, but worker owned, right? And then again, sort of land back, what other forms of relation that we don't even name as ownership does the land back demand begin to proliferate? So to me, 
the kinds of political subjectivity or questions that it generates by, by thinking first and foremost with the unpayable debts concept is to, to think what, what I heard Denise encouraging us, which is to think at the horizon and then let it proliferate backward. And I really, I, I love thinking that way. And I think that is kind of the most important way to think even as we slog through the non-reformist reforms that we slog through every day. And uh, so, yeah, I, I was going to say something along those lines, but then just to, to make the work, the walking backwards, or maybe not back, but at the same time, also attending so as we do not reproduce that whatever political subject in the liberal or the historical materialist frames, right? Which is what we'll do because that's how we've been doing the political all along. But I think the simple answer is, which is not simple at all, is that all those other political subjectivities will have to explode, not only implode, but explode. Um, what else we, you know, will not, we won't, will not be able to envision anything that has as a horizon, uh, the end of state capital, right? Because state capital are so much made possible by taking that land and that labor. Okay, so there's a number of uh, great questions in the q and I probably just have time for um, one more, maybe two. Um, but what I'll do is whichever ones are left over, I'll make sure to send them all to the panelists so they have them. Um, I think this one could be quite relevant. Um, so how is revenge being enacted in the oppressed black and poor in COVID times? They just let him die, isn't it? Oh my God, if not actively. I'm just thinking about what's happening in Brazil now. Um, let's talk about revenge um, with all the gains, the little gains that black and indigenous um, territories and populations had in Brazil. And the Bolsonaro administration is coming with a vengeance. And uh, almost, I mean, it's active. It's not just about indifference, it's active. Um, in difference. Um, there we see revenge very much against the minimum gains, right? Because the gains made then did not include, I mean, the main, the gains were made with affirmative action and some land acknowledge, territory acknowledgement, et cetera, but, uh, but at the same time under police brutality or army brutality when you talk about um, the North Brazil and the indigenous communities, so yeah. All that I can see is revenge. Similarly in the US, um, in the first months of the pandemic, um, for reasons that uh, black and, and Latinas and other people of color were the main uh, essential workers. So they were on the line of fire. Um, and then uh, their, the hospitals in their communities were the least equipped uh, uh, and you know with the least of capacity to um, to cope with COVID. And you can see that in the disproportionate number of deaths that already have been reported by race and class in the US. So very similar uh, context. I just wanna echo that and, and globalize it too, by saying that like somehow I think in COVID what has actually been a process of underway for 500 or more years um, has shown, shown itself uh, in its whole, in its full nakedness, which is how valuable a resource anti-black revenge is for capital's reproduction. I mean, invaluable for it. Um, and I think the the pandemic just reveals that, like it was already close to the surface, and now it, everything else has been wiped away. Um, but it's curious to me how. I, and I'm not an expert on this, so I'm very curious to learn more about it, the way that anti-Black racism has manifested itself globally in a whole range of places um, that allow then these kind of reproduction of the, the extractive and accumulative state um, in ways that allow it to kind of suspend its ongoing crisis of indebtedness and financialization. Uh, it's terrifying. Does anyone else want to jump in or? No, okay. Well, that's probably about all we've got time for tonight. Um, 
but I just want to say thank you so much to our amazing speakers. It was really so enriching um, and so great to hear from such a range of perspectives. You're all involved in such different things, but um, with so many lines of solidarity across them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to Max, Denise, Hannah and Francis. And thank you also to the co-sponsors, um, which once again are reimagining Value Action Lab at Lakehead University, the Race and Capitalism Project at the University of Chicago, the Luskin Institute on Inequality and Democracy at University of California, the Institute for Advanced Studies at University College London, and the Debt and Education Working Group at the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Um, and I do also want to say thank you to our, our amazing audience.